Um, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Okay, hi everyone, my name is Sarah. I'm a first year student in the BMS program. And today I'm gonna introduce Dr. Yibin Princeton University, and he completed his undergraduate training at Duke University. Um, Duke University Medical Center in 2000 and Dr. Brian Cullen's laboratory where he studied transcriptional and post-transcriptional regulation of eukaryotic gene expression. He then joined Dr. Joan Mas Masog's laboratory at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center where he performed functional genomic analysis of breast cancer bone metastasis. In 2004, he joined Princeton University as an associate professor and is now a Warner Lampert Park Davis Professor of Molecular Biology at Princeton University and an Associate Director of Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey. His research focuses on the molecular mechanisms of breast cancer metastasis, and his laboratory group uses both computational tools, animal models, and in vivo imaging to analyze the basis of breast cancer metastasis. To date, he has published well over 100 articles in leading journals, such as cancer cell, cell, and nature medicine. And through his research, he has identified novel genes that promote metastasis and chemo resistance of breast cancer. And additionally, his group has recently identified the gene metaherin as a therapeutic target for chemo resistant breast cancer. Dr. Kung has received many honors and awards for his research and has even served as president of the Metastasis Research Society from 2016 to 2018. So with that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Kong. Thank you, Sarah. And it's my great pleasure to give the talk at this uh, seminar course series. And I was looking forward to visit San Diego, but unfortunately the uh, Omicron threw everything off track, uh, but it's still very nice to reconnect with some of the old friends. Uh, so today I'm going to focus my talk on just one gene that we have studied in the lab for the last 70 years or so. But it's nice to actually present the whole evolution of the story, especially in the context of this particular course about you know, developing therapeutics for, for cancer. So my lab, as Sarah mentioned, is mostly focused on focusing on this, the question of cancer metastasis. And the reason for that is obvious. When you look at the sub five year survival rate of various different kinds of cancer over the years, from 2000 up to more recent years, um, when patients have early stage cancer, like breast cancer, coronary cancer, melanoma, also uh, the survival rate is, is nearly 100% for those stage one cancer. Uh, but when pa patients develop metastatic cancer to distant organs, the survival rate is much lower. And also have not really improved much uh, over the years. And so that is an urgent medical problem to uh, a med medical need to, to try to address. So it's important to try to figure out how cancer acquire the metastatic ability because not all cancers are, are born equal. You know, some of them can metastasize, some of them cannot. And so we already know quite well how cancer come from a normal cell. Usually, maybe you are first year graduate student, you know about oncogenes that get mutated, become considered active in cancer cell, and then the loss of tumor suppressor is also a very important equation in this process. So depending on the cancer type that you are studying, there are specific oncogenes or tumor suppressors, and some of them are shared across different cancer types. So that's well understood. But usually those are not sufficient to drive a metastatic phenotype. And you know, over the last 20, 30 years, a lot of study have gone into what kind of char characteristics the metastatic cancer cell have. And what I'm trying to sum up here in this uh, slide and also more extensively in two review articles that we published <clears throat> in the last couple of years, you can read more into that if you're interested in this area, is the concept that the metastatic competency is the consequence of um, the cancer cell dealing with increasing level of stress when they try to disseminate and metastasize and you know, also under the stress of different kinds of treatments. Uh, so to deal with those different kinds of stress, for example, the immune attack, the oxidative distress, the genomic instability, unfolded protein you know, response and, and, and different metabolic requirements, 
the cancer cell acquire properties to deal with those stress uh, through activation of so-called cancer fitness pathway. Essentially, those pathways that allow them to deal with all these different kinds of stress better. And as a consequence, they only survive stress better. Many of the byproduct of that is that they become more invasive, they become more migratory, they, they can survive, you know, you know, circulation or immune attack better or become invisible. And so that leads to increased metastatic phenotype. So it's actually an untended consequence of you know, cancer cells dealing with stress and become more, more, more um, um, basically virulent. And so, um, you know, that is sort of like the, the context of what I try to present today is, you know, in addition to oncogene and tumor suppressor, there's a third class of gene that are very important, which is called cancer fitness gene. And they're different from oncogene because they, when you overexpress those genes, they do not cause cancer. They are not driver of oncogenesis. And they are also specifically required for cancer cell under stress, especially metastatic cancer cell, because normal cells are not under stress. So they are less important for normal cell to survive in physiological condition. And therefore they are better therapeutic targets because they are critically required specifically for, for cancer cell. So that's the context. Um, in terms of cancer treatment, um, there are two questions that is critically important, not only for patients, but also for doctors. One is you could have two patients coming with same early stage breast cancer, but their outcome could be very different. One could be essentially cure after surgery and, you know, and removal of the primary tumor. The other one might have the same surgery and the tumor will be removed, the non residual disease, but then they are disseminated tumor cell in their distant organ and somehow they can come back after a couple of years and become avert, you know, metastasis in the distant organ and fail all the treatments and the patient die from it. So for patients with early stage disease, they are all, always under constant threat of recurrence. You know, about 20% of early stage breast cancer eventually develop metastatic disease. And so for doctors and the, the family of the patient, it's important to figure out whether their tumor is high risk or low risk, because if it's high risk, it should be treated with more aggressive adjuvant treatment. If it's low risk, maybe they, they could be spared of very harmful, for example, adjuvant chemotherapy. So that's an important uh, point to, to try to address. The other follow-up question is that if the patient unfortunately have high risk cancer, do we just tell them that you have high risk cancer, but there's really not much other than just wait, you know, and observe closely? It's better that we can figure out what is the driver G behind the poor performance of cancer. And better yet, if we have target therapy to prevent them from driving the recurrence and metastasis of cancer. So that's the question we also need to address as well. So regarding the first question, this is the crystal ball question of predicting the future outcome or the cause of the disease, that has been addressed uh, with the advent of genomic profiling technology, initially by Michael Ray and more recently by RNA sequencing. And so this is the work, primary work done by Laura Van Beer and others published 20 years ago, showing that you can use a, a so-called poor prognosis gene expression signature here uh, by um, defining 50 genes uh, if they are highly expressed and the other 20 genes that are weakly expressed, the tumor that have this kind of profile are the so-called poor prognosis cancer. And they are likely to have um, recurrence or metastasis. On the other hand, if the tumor have the opposite signature, 50 gene is low and 20 gene is uh, high, um, they have the so-called poor prognosis, good prognosis tumor and they are, they are likely to you know, have complete uh, remission of the disease after surgery. So this is good in terms of giving us a biomarker, but it doesn't really tell us what is the drive, what are the driver genes behind the poor prognosis cancer. And that is the question that we, we try to figure out. The question then is to how do you identify them? Um, and so when we look at a history of how driver genes, oncogenes or tumor suppressors are, are identified in, in cancer research, one of the recurrent themes is that those genes are usually located in so-called recurrent genomic event low sites. And once you find those locus, 
uh, you, you can then try to dig in to find the driver Z. <clears throat> so I'm showing you two classical example here. One is the so-called Philadelphia chromosome, which is created by the translocation between chromosome nine and 22 that leads to creation of the BCR able fusion on Cozier. <clears throat> and that was just identified in, in 1960s in Philadelphia. And then many years, 40 years later, Gleevec is a small molecule kinase inhibitor against BCR able was developed to essentially make this lethal disease, chronic myelogenia leukemia, into a more uh, treatable chronic uh, situation that is not life threatening to the patient. Uh, similarly, in breast cancer, HER2 amplification is the hallmark of HER2 positive breast cancer. And this is a driver gene uh, that is now targeted by Herceptin and many other similar class of drugs to uh, really effectively uh, control you know, this, this type of HER2 positive breast cancer. So our thought is that if you can, instead of comparing tumor to normal cell, like what I'm showing you here, can you try to compare poor prognosis tumor versus good prognosis tumor and try to identify recurrent genomic events like amplification or deletions that, that could be consistently observed in those poor prognosis tumors. And then if you can find a landmark, maybe you can dig in to find the driver gene. So how do you do that? Uh, we, at the time the lab was starting, so we, we don't have the time and the resource to look into thousands of patients, samples, look at the copy number and so on. But we decide to use computational biology approach to essentially convert the existing data that is already in the public domain, which is the mRNA differential expression of poor prognosis tumor versus good prognosis tumor. Based on, on the idea that if in the poor prognosis tumor, a locus is amplified, consistently amplified across different tumors, the genes in that locus, in the center of that locus and its nearby neighbor, are likely to have elevated MR expression level. And that will be reflected in the MR gene expression data that is already publicly available. So the question is, how can you use that information to convert differential MR expression into you know, prediction of the copy number change? And that could be done by running a, a so-called running sum calculation of so-called neighborhood score in which the, the differentially expressed gene, so this is lining up genes along the chromosome and give them a expression score based on their relative expression in poor prognosis versus good prognosis tumor. So a running sum is by calculating, you know, the genes in the, the locus plus its neighbors uh, into a, a, a sum. But the, 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 the genes that are far away from the locus in consideration will be given a decreasing weight because they are far away from the, the, the center of the locus in consideration. And so that essentially convert a differential among a expression score into a so-called neighborhood score that is related to copy number gain or copy number loss. So using this algorithm, we, we analyze three large breast cancer data set by Van Deer, the original Van Deer study and the follow-up a study and, and then a separate study by Wang L, um, three cohort, different cohorts of patients. And we, we see peak and values you know, across different data sets. But the one that always show up is in AQ22, chromosome locus AQ22. You can see the peak here. So this is predicted to be having a high copy number in the poor prognosis of breast cancer. But that's, that's just based on computational analysis of MRI data. We want to see that in real tumor that really is happening. So then we use fish to paint essentially chromosome AQ22 into orange and then the centrosome of chromosome eight as the, um, the control. And when we show that indeed, uh, you, can, you can see some tumors, uh, about a quarter of tumor, breast cancer have high copy number AQ22 and then three other copy doesn't have it. And the high copy number tumor have poor prognosis in terms of metastasis-free survival. And that is consistent with our prediction. So this really happens, not just based on mathematical uh, calculation. So because we are, we are calculating this locus based on thousands of samples, this allow us essentially find a minimal overlap across different you know, tumors. And that's a small, very small reason containing only about a dozen genes, including about six or, six or seven of them that have very high differential expression of the genes in poor prognosis versus good prognosis tumor. 
So then we can then go back to the lab and then overexpress clonal genes one by one, overexpress them in, in a breast cancer cell line, and then inject them into the mice, tail bear injection to look at lung metastasis to see if any of them can promote metastasis progression when they are overexpressed. So this is photon flux is really measuring the, the meta lung metastasis burden. And what you can see is that among all the genes we tested, it's this one, MTDH, located right at the center of this amplicon, uh, has the ability to drive metastasis progression about five-fold increase after it's overexpressed in breast cancer cells. So this is also validated at the, at the uh, you know, patient samples that when you do immunohistochemistry to stain for amount, uh, protein level of material expression, we see about 40% of breast tumor have high protein level MTDS across different subtype of breast cancer. And that high level of uh, high material uh, expression is correlated with metastasis free, poor metastasis free survival and cancer specific death. So in the same study, we not only also show material drive metastasis, but at the same time, is also causing broad spectrum chemo resistance to a number of different chemo agents. So these two regions perhaps try the, the high aggressiveness of those high material tumors. But at the time when we published this work, there were only a total of about six people on the PubMed, and there's almost zero understanding about what does material do in normal physiology and, and in the con context of cancer. So Li Lin Wang uh, was a graduate student at the time uh, to start and she's now at UPenn running her own lab. So she used a gene trap allele of materian to essentially knock out materian you know, from the embryonic space in the whole body of the mice. And because this is a gene trap allele uh, targeted by beta gale, you can also see the expression pattern of the protein is qu quite universally expressed in many different tissues. But the embryo developed completely normally and the mice was born and breathed just completely normally just like the wild type mice. So no phenotype in the whole body knockout of material. And you can also see the memory gland development a slight delay, but pretty much normally during puberty and during pregnancy. So then we, we can then use this whole body knockout mice to cross with different mouse models of breast cancer to see whether this gene is really important for breast cancer progression. So uh, breast cancer is mostly divided into like five major subtype, but mostly luminal and basal and, and HER2 positive and so on. So different subtype breast cancer can be you know, or, or reflected by a model by overexpressing different oncogenes in the memory drug using the MMTV promoter. So if you overexpress wind, you drive the formation of basal like breast cancer. And if you overexpress polymer middle T, uh, uh, viral oncogene or HER2 or B2 new, uh, that drive the formation of more luminal type breast cancer. So the then just cross this knockout mice with all these different subtypes of breast cancer and university uh, knocking out material and delay the formation of breast cancer and metastasis. So this is the first example is PRMT model. This, this is a highly aggressive, rapidly developing breast cancer. You can see in a, in a wild type mice in red within 80 days, 70 days, um, all, all the mice develop, develop tumors. But if you knock out one copy in green or two alleles of material, there's a 20, more than 20 day delay of tumor initiation. And if you quantify the total tumor burden by measuring the memory gland tumors, you can see there's a huge difference, you know, those depending effect of knocking out either one or two alleles of material. And that is more visible showing here. So the wild type mice have multiple memory gland tumors here. The same age of knockout mice, material knockout mice, still have long gene, but very little tumor formation. And compared to wild type mice, they have lung metastasis everywhere in the lung. The knockout mice have very little, almost no lung metastasis. The same result was observing a, a slower developing breast cancer model driven by HER2 new. And you can again see those dependent delay of uh, knocking out material in the tumor initiation. The wind model is the similar result. So if you can, if you knock out material to a little bit, you can see a dramatic uh, delay uh, inhibition of, of wind driven basal like breast cancer formation. And the last model, the number four model, 
being used is the the uh, MPA and DMBA carcinogen hormone induced heterogeneous breast cancer. And again, you can see a dose dependent effect of uh, delaying tumor formation by methylene knockout. So this is slightly different from what we initially uh, focus, why we focus on methylene as a metastasis driver. Here is really looking at early stage formation of breast cancer, and you can already see a delay. And in fact, when you look at a very early hypoplasia state, so in the wild type mice driven by a different oncogene, when you can see the hypoplasia, the knockout in the wild type mice, the knockout mice, the mammogram is still relatively pretty much normal. So the delay is happening very early stage. And that prompts us to think that maybe Methylene, loss of methylene will cause defect in the so called cancer stem cell or tumor initiation cell activity. And you can analyze the TIC activity using a couple of assays. The first one is in vitro. So you can use the so called uh, tumor sphere formation assay and use a number of spheres in, um, in, in you know, formation in the, the 3D sphere formation in soft agar as a reflection of TIC activity. And you can see cells isolated from the hyperplasia state in the wild type. Mice versus knockout mice, the knockout mice have a significant delay, uh, deficiency in the tumor sphere formation. Another assay is more rigorous, so called limited dilution TIC uh, tumor initiation study. So instead of injecting, usually you inject millions of cells to form tumors. Here we are injecting very few cells, like 100 up to 2000. And uh, such only a small fraction of mice would develop tumors. So these are mice injected with the cells isolated from hyperplasia state wild type mammogram versus the cell isolated from knockout mice. And you can see there's a severe defect in TIC activity in the knockout cells. So we then look more closely at the different subpopulation of the cells in the mammogram to see what, what is the change happening there. So uh, people who are in the mammogram field have developed two markers, T24 and 29, and you can use them to isolate either the luminal enriched population, 24 parts to 29 no, or 24 parts to 29 high basal population. This is enriched for memory stem cell activity. And the third population here is mostly stromal cells. So what we can see is that in the wild type mice, compared to the you know, normal mice without oncogene, the expression of polymerino T in the memory gland uh, in the hyperplasia state leads to a expansion of the luminal population. And that makes sense because the, the tumor eventually becomes a luminal type breast cancer. Likewise, the, the memory gland driven by uh, wind oncogene leads to expansion of the basal population. But interestingly, the same age of mice, uh, in the knockout mice, you don't see corresponding expansion of either the luminal population or the basal population. So the, the question is, are those expanded population, the TIC containing uh, population? And you can test that directly by uh, looking at the, um, uh, looking, looking at the, for example, polymer middle P model, looking at the cell isolate from the luminal population or the basal population, and the same number of cells will be injected into the mice. You can see only the cells isolated from the luminal population have TIC activity, not the basal, basal population. So this is consistent with the hypothesis. So now the second experiment is taking the luminal cell that, that contain TICs from either wild type mice or the knockout uh, mice. The same number of cells are injected into the mice, and you can see the knockout mice, even though the same number of cells are injected, they have less ability to form tumors. So there's not only a quantitative decrease of the expansion of the luminal population, but the quality of those cells to form tumor is significantly uh, effective as well. So we, we did the same experiment across different models, and the conclusion is the following. I already told you the conclusion for colonial immunity. The wind model is, is also consistent is the basal population that get amplified and that contain TIC activity. And uh, in the HER2 new model, both population have TIC activity. And the material knockout uh, reduced the expansion of those TIC containing population and also reduced the ability of those populations to form tumors. So that's the study initially done in breast cancer, but we are curious to see whether this is limited to breast cancer or is, is it 
material required for other cancer type as well. So we look at prostate cancer and just like breast cancer, we can see in prostate cancer, human prostate cancer with increasing tumor grade all the way to metastasis, there's increasing material expression and high material expression is associated with poor clinical outcome. And just like the breast cancer model, so we compare the wild type mice versus knockout mice and their prostate gland developed completely normally. But in the mice that they are genetically engineered to have prostate cancer from expression of large T antigen in the prostate gland, uh, the mice will develop large tumors and it progress to high grade tumors and metastasis liver and lung and kill the mice. The knockout mice develop low grade tumor and rarely progress to high grade and almost never metastasize. So there's also a severe defect of the tumor in terms of initiation and progression when you knock out metastasis. And then we also then cross with other cancers. For example, uh, you know, APC min mice model, that is a model for intestinal uh, cancer or, or corresponding to coronal cancer in, in humans. And you can again see that it's almost a dose depending effect of material knockout in reducing tumor initiation, uh, reducing the tumor number and the tumor burden in the intestine. The fourth model we test is lung cancer model driven by uh, KRS. And again, you can see those depending effect of knocking on material and delaying tumor initiation and reduce uh, lung tumor burden as well. So this is also done by other group in the field. Uh, they also make their own whole body material knockout. And uh, Paul Fisher's group shows that those mice that have material knockout, when you feed them with drinking water that contain carcinogen that cause liver cancer, they also have a severe, severe delay in liver cancer initiation and metastasis. And when you age the mice, they, they don't develop the age-related tumor as, as easy as wild-time mice. But those experiments are all done using whole body knockout early you know, in the mice life, you know, early since the embryonic stage. And the question is, is this gene still required for late stage cancer when you know, tumor is already well developed or the metastasis already formed? Because that's important when you consider that whether that is going to be a good therapeutic target. So to address that question, we create a uh, bacterial flux mice and cross it with UBC Cree ER mice. So this is ubiquitous model driving a Cree ER, which the Cree recombinase activity will be activated by treating the mice with um, the uh, you know, containing drinkable water. And so um, this will lead to uh, you know, conditional knockout of material when we treat the mice with tamoxifen. So we then cross these mice with MNTB polymer middle T mice. And then um, after the tumor is already well developed by palpation, we then treat the mice with tamoxifen. And so you can see that, you know, the tamoxifen treatment delete material in the, in the mice. And so I'm going to show you the data from the mice. Uh, they are treated with tamoxifen or with vehicle the, week, the weeks of following treatment. So the, the tumor looks very small in the beginning because this is the, the size that we started, but it's already palpable. Same size when we start the treatment. But with tamoxifen treatment to delete material, there's a significant delay in the continuous growth of the tumor. And there's also a dramatic reduction of lung metastasis. So when you look at the, the tumor, you can see the mice that are treated with tamoxifen um, have less cell proliferation, increased apoptosis across three different models. We use the, the uh, polymer immunity model, the C3 model, this is another basal like breast cancer model, and the weight model. So universally across different subtype breast cancer, uh, methylene is important uh, for sustaining the, the, the growth of the tumor. So, the conclusion we have so far is that material seems to be a universally important gene across many different cancer types, and not only important for primary tumor formation, but also later on for metastasis as well. So importantly, there are two features that make it really appealing. One is that it's not essential for normal development. You can knock out material in the mice completely, to develop completely normally. So you could expect that a agent that target material have very little toxicity. And uh, interestingly also, this is not a classical open gene because when we make a transgenic mice overexpressed material in the membrane gland, 
uh, it does not lead to any tumor formation. So this is specifically required uh, for sustaining tumor expansion, uh, but itself is not a, a driver for protein. So all this suggests it could be a good therapeutic target, uh, but we still don't have any handle in terms of how to target it. So one way is to figure out how does this protein work by interacting with its partner. So Andrea uh, Blanco, a former grad student, did a co-IP experiment in which he put down metaphorin in a wild type versus you know, control cell that do not have metaphorin. And now you can detect the metaphorin band, you can see two extra bands here. And that is confirmed by MassBet to be an interesting protein called SMD1. Again, this is a relatively obscure protein. Uh, it's known to be a component of the risk complex, so it could be involved in microRNA processing. But it's also known to be regulated, for example, transcription or you know, or temper splicing and so on. Uh, but in terms of cancer, it behaves very similar to material. So high expression of SND1 is associated with poor outcome in breast cancer and other cancers. And if you knock down SND1, you reduce the metastasis and also make the cell sensitive to chemotherapy. So the similar behavior as at MTDH. And so the work by leading also look into more mechanisms about why this complex is important. And the conclusion is, is shown by Khatoum here. So the conclusion is the following. Uh, when the, the tumor is forming under oncogenic stress, for the TICs to survive, they need the presence of this complex. Um, so in, in cell that we knock out at the the SND1 protein become very unstable under oncogenic stress and get degraded. And then that leads to apoptosis of TICs and that is reduced primary tumor formation and reduced metastasis. So that's the conclusion from that study uh, eight years ago. So we then, uh, I collaborate with uh, my classmate back in, in China, um, Yuna Xing, who is now running his her own lab at University of Wisconsin in structural biology studies. So we solved the crystal structure of uh, material which I'm showing you only a, a peptide material in yellow binding to SND1. So material in yellow binding to SND1 surface. And the critical residue to focus on is two tryptophan. So in red color here. So this is a hydrophobic side chain of tryptophan inserted into hydrophobic pocket in the surface of SND1. So in cyan uh, color. And this two tryptophans are important because if you mutate either one of the tryptophan or material, you lose the binding of material to SND1 by co-IP experiment. And also in the limited dilution TIC assay, uh, starting from the material knockout to the cells that have little TIC activity, you can rescue that by overexpressing wild type material, but you cannot rescue by expressing the, either one of the tryptophan mutants. So the, this tryptophan dependent interaction is critical. And that gives us some clue about maybe we can develop a small molecule compound that could bind to those same hydrophobic pockets as inhibitors of protein protein interaction as potentially therapeutic agents. So uh, Ming Hong then, uh, post in the lab, then developed a assay to screen for those compounds. So he then, he, he split the luciferase into the N terminal and the C terminal domain. And so he used the luciferase activity but then he, he fused the N terminal to SND1 and the C terminal to MTDH. If these two proteins bind to each other, if you design this chimeric protein in the right conformation, you will bring the luciferase domain back together and reconstitute the luciferase activity. But if you have a small molecular inhibitor, you, you disrupt the protein protein interaction and you lose the luciferase activity. And you use, uh, he then used the a link luciferase to screen out false positive hits that do not inhibit protein protein interaction, but inhibit enzymatic activity of the luciferase. And then secondary assay is a FRAT assay to validate the compounds. So we use this assay to screen a library, um, a Princeton small, small molecular screening center, eventually focus on this series called C26 series compound. So it's relatively small, chemical compound have very similar structure. And you can see that it can inhibit luciferase activity, you know, about, about two, um, one to two micromole IC50 concentration, uh, similar to the, the wild type methylene peptide. 
And this compound can also block a SYNB1 binding, a material binding to a SYNB1 by co IP experiment. We then uh, also solve the co crystal structure of the compound binding to SND1. And just as we, we predicted, it indeed binds to one of the two pockets occupied by tryptophan. So it's pocket two occupied by tryptophan 401 that is then occupied now by C26A6. And so now you're showing, I'm showing the overlap between these two, two binding moieties. So blue line, dark blue is SND1. And so Mahirin um, Papai is in red and tryptophan 401 is showing here, binding to this, uh, this, this cavity. The same cavity then now is occupied by C26A6 at the, the same you know, orientation. So the compound is hitting the target exactly as we predicted. We then are very excited then to test them in the mice to see if it has any therapeutic effects. So we start with a mouse uh, cell line derived from a POMT tumor, inject into the memory gland to form primary tumor, and then develop the mice with develop lung metastasis. So we wait until the tumor is established, and then we treat the mice with either a vehicle or C26A6 as a, a, a single agent. And so treatment starts at week, week two when the size of the tumor is the same. But you can see with the, the compound treatment, there is a significant delay in primary tumor formation, and this is the, the size of tumor at the end of the treatment. And also the lung metastasis is significantly inhibited. So even as a single agent, the compound has, has therapeutic effect. Um, and we are also interested in combinational therapy because we previously saw that material is, is important for promoting chemo resistance. So here we have three group of treatment. One is the vehicle, the other one is the compound itself, third one is the paclitaxel standard chemotherapy, and then a combined treatment. So we can see even though single agent have anti-tumor effect, it's the combined treatment that have the most significant reduction of the primary tumor and the lung metastasis is, is also dramatically reduced uh, compared to a single treatment. And the mice survival is, is much more uh, extended. So we are then interested in what kind of changes at the molecular level when you target material SND1 complex. So we are lucky now to have two different tools to look at that gene expression changes. One is using the next tool. We can then, we can treat the mice with uh, drugs deal of material with tamoxifen. And so we can acutely delete material. Or we can treat the mice with compound, so a pharmacological approach. And if, if the compound is hitting the gene, exactly I would predict, we should see similar change of gene expression pattern in two kinds of treatments. And that's indeed the case. So the genes that are elevated after material knockout is similarly strongly enriched in ranked genes of uh, the genes rank after you know they are treatment with C26A6. And conversely, genes that are down with genetic knockout is negatively enriched with pharmacologic, pharmacological inhibition. And the gene sets that are enriched in, in one of the treatment is similarly enriched in another kind of treatment. So it's almost a complete phenocopy in terms of gene expression pattern between genetic or pharmacological inhibition of this complex. And this is also so by unsupervised clustering, showing that either genetic deletion or pharmacological inhibition of material, uh, the, the tumors are clustered together compared to the control. So then uh, when you look at a specific gene sets that are enriched, the obvious one, of course, is the cell, uh, cell proliferation, cell cycle progression, you know, is significantly uh, inhibited or, or negatively enriched. And then the pathways that are related to cell death or, you know, uh, is, uh, uh, is partially enriched, the cell is undergoing apoptosis. And that is consistent with, you know, the compound treatment, just like material knockout, leads to reduce proliferation and increase apoptosis. That's expected. But one of the unexpected and interesting, surprising finding is that one of the most highly enriched gene set is the interferon response. So interferon response is very strongly enriched when you either genetically knock out material or treat them with C26A6 compound. And that is an indication of strong immune reaction that is being activated against tumor. And that is also consistent with the observation that when we knock out material acutely, there is an increased infiltration of either C26A6 
PD3 immune cell, and especially CDA positive uh, cytotoxic T cells. And that is consistent uh, with the clinical observation of a, a correlation between uh, high material expression with low immune infiltration. In tumors that have low metaphyrin expression, there is more immune infiltration, even though a lot of those immune cells become exhausted with high PD-1 expression. So this is also consistent with some of the early observations that we made in the lab, but we are kind of puzzled with that is that the phenotype of metaphyrin seems to be very dependent on whether the mice is immunodeficient or immunocompetent. So for example, when we derive cell lines from pure MT tumor, and uh, you know, either from the wild type uh, tumor or material knockout tumor. In the, in the immunodeficient mice, when we do tailway injection and look at lung metastasis, they grow at the same rate. But the growth of material knockout tumor in terms of lung metastasis is strongly suppressed in the immunocompetent host. And that could be rescued by overexpressing material in those material knockout tumors. Conversely, uh, if, you know, in the wild type mice that inhibit the growth of those, 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 uh, those material knockout tumors, if you use antibody to deplete uh, CDA, CDA T cells, we can then rescue the metastatic growth in the lung. So it means that part of the important function of material is to protect the tumor, tumor cells from the immune attack in the immunocompetent host. So because of that, we decided to develop a, a assay system to look at the cytotoxic T cell killing uh, of the tumors, either with or without methylene. So we, uh, we engineered the PRMT tumors to overexpress the OVA antigen. And that could be specifically recognized by splenocytes or, or T cells isolated from OT1 mice that have high level T cells against OVA antigen. So we then isolate those splenocytes and then co-culture them with uh, the, the tumor cells with overexpression with or without mass adhering. And so the observation is that when the tumor have uh, methylene knocked down, so the lack of expression, they, have, they are much more sensitive to T cell, uh, cytotoxic T cell killing, as also reflected by PARP and CLIP caspase uh, Western blood. And those T cells are activated when they are exposed to those um, overexpressing uh, tumor cells that have low material expression. And when you rescue material expression, then you suppress the immune response and the tumor becomes less sensitive to T cell killing. So we then look into the mechanism, look at the genes downstream of, of, of uh, you know, the material SND1 control and, and many other different aspects. And then focus on uh, one of the most important targets, TAP1 and TAP2. So this, uh, protein is really uh, important for the antigen presentation pathway. And so what we find out is that MTDS and SND1 protein complex binds to TEP1 and TEP2 mRNA. And this binding um, make the, the mRNA unstable and degrade it quickly. So I'm showing you some of the data here. So this is uh, in, in a co-culture experiment, looking at the, the tumor expression of TEP1 and TEP2, zero hour, 24 hour after co-culture. And you can see that with methylene not, not, not down, there's a more higher level of TEP1 or TEP2 expression level. And this is also shown by Western blood, higher level of TEP1 and TEP2 as well. And this is looking at the RNA stability. So looking at the cell treated with actomycin B to, to block the novel uh, RNA synthesis. And you can see that the TEP1 and TEP2 mRNA are much more stable in the methylene knockdown cells. So, we also show that the material protein and also SND1 binds to TEP1 and TEP2 RNA by uh, RNA uh, immunoprecipitation experiment, also by gel shift experiment. And then also when you knock down uh, adhering, there's increased um, antigen present over antigen presentation in the, in the surface of the tumor cells. So this is using genetic approach to knocking down uh, material. Uh, we also use the compound to show that when you treat the cell with C26A6, you inhibit methylene and SMD1 binding to TEP1 and TEP2 among it. And that it leads to increased stability and uh, stable state level of TEP1 and TEP2 among expression. Um, and also increase antigen presentation 
and also increase immune cell activation. So, um, the, the, so with maturing inhibition, you can see there is increase, uh, we can see increased immune cell infiltration. Well, at the same time, we also in, observe increased PD-1 expression in maturing knockdown cell, and that is also rescued by maturing knockout. Similarly, in the compound treated tumors, we also see increased PD-1 expression in the tumor. So that means that even though when you inhibit maturing, you increase antigen presentation, there is more immune cell infiltration and activation, those cells eventually get exhausted. So we thought that maybe a good combination is to treat the tumor with the compound, C26A6 compound to activate the immune cell regulation and infiltration. And at the same time, use the standard anti-PD-1 immune checkpoint uh, blockade therapy to um, make those uh, T cells much more active, sustain their activity and then achieve better response. So this is the same kind of model we use. Uh, again, we, are, we have four kinds of treatment. Anti-PD-1 uh, treatment alone have very little response because the tumor is supposedly not very responsive to immunosuppressive immune cold tumor. The compound itself, as I showed you earlier, have uh, some, some uh, anti-tumor effects, but it's the combined treatment that have the most dramatic treatment, a dramatic reduction of primary tumor growth, and also significant almost complete elimination of lung metastasis. And also with the combined treatment, we can see more CD8 T cell infiltration, uh, both in the primary tumor and in the, in the lung metastasis, and also more activation of the T cell as well. And so uh, then, you know, one of the reviewers request is to see if we can then treat the mice at the terminal stage, or they already have, you know, well-established lung metastasis, can the treatment still effective? Because that's like the high bar we try to meet now in similar to clinical case is a lot of patients are dying from lung metastasis and or other kind of metastasis and fail all the treatments. Can, can this treatment be a rescue for those patients? So we, we treat one group of mice. So we developed uh, this lung metastasis model. We inject the mouse tumor cell into a tail vein and the, the mice develop lung metastasis. After that, um, we then, you know, after three weeks after we detect Lung metastasis are well established. We treat the mice either with vehicle or the combined treatment. And then, you know, observe in the next three weeks, you can see that the, the non, you know, the control group rapidly progress, you know, to lethal stage. The, the, the combined treatment, about half of the tumor becomes stabilized or regressed. The other half still have a significant, almost tenfold, at least more than tenfold reduction of lung metastasis progression, and the mice survive longer. Uh, much longer. So this suggests that is this great promise to combining this compound with immunotherapy to increase the efficacy in a larger cohort of patients. So with that, I want to just summarize by showing you that this is a lot in this, this study from beginning to now takes about at least 15 years. Um, and we started by basically from the best side to the bench, right? We, we have this clinical observation that certain tumors are more aggressive than the others, but we don't know why. But the genomic data and then some careful computational analysis leads to identification of AQ22 that leads us to identification of metatherine. And then we, what we did next is using mouse genetic model to really carefully show that it's not only important for breast cancer, but across many major cancers and also all different states of cancer. And you know, we get some insights about what kind of important roles in, for example, sustaining TLC activity, making the tumor survive better under stress, and also evade the immune response. But then the drug development benefit from the inside, we, we get from the biochemistry finding out its partner, the, the structure biology study finding out the interface that could be amenable for therapeutic intervention. And then now we have the compound that seems to work well, and we're hoping to close the last gap to you know, optimize it for clinical use in, in the patients that we started out to help. So I want to end by thanking a large number of students and postdocs, all of them become independent faculty members after they, they left the lab. Um, they all contribute to different aspects of the work, but the, the most important work I show you uh, is was published uh, late last year was done by Ming Hongsheng, who just really recently started in her own lab in, in Michigan. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention and take your questions.
Great, thank you so much. So just a reminder, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A. Uh, the first question is from Dottie. Dottie, do you wanna ask your question? Or I can just read it. Um, are there different mechanisms behind reoccurrence in the same place, like breast cancer comes back um, versus metatastasis? And yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that is an uh, interesting question. So a lot of the local recurrence, uh, maybe it's just because of residual cancer that sometimes, it's, you know, um, um, the surgical margin is not completely clean. And so you might have some leftover tumors and that could have local recurrence directly soon after surgery. That's a very unfortunate situation. But a lot of the distant recurrence often happen later in the delayed kinetics, and that is often from disseminated tumors after long-term dormancy, then they, they recur. And oftentimes they could have very different, actually, you know, molecular characteristic. And for example, a HER2 negative tumor might become HER2 positive in, in, in bone metastasis because the stroma select for a certain, certain type of, uh, you know, uh, breast cancer to survive better in bone. So, um, it, it could be different mechanism that different distance site recurrence might select for different, you know, type of uh, recurrent metastatic tumors. And there's actually a lot of genomic studies have gone into that regarding what kind of, uh, you know, genomic alterations that happen between different organ site metastasis. And still, I think it's a still interesting question to observe in terms of this interplay between tumor and stroma that leads to recurrence to happen in different organs. Okay, the next question is from Christy. Do you wanna unmute yourself? Sure, hi. Um, so I was wondering about the um, role of dendritic cells in, um, yeah, in this process and, and if you've right. explored DC activation yeah. or anything. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Actually, a lot of study, we kind of focus on maturing in, uh, tumors, right? But um, there are actually a lot of evidence, some of them are published, some of them are unpublished in, in my lab, showing that the bacterial expression in the, in the immune cell is also important for that process. So for example, if you inject the same, for example, wild type tumor into a host that is wild type versus host that are deficient in bacterial, the bacterial deficient host have more rapid progression of tumor. So there's a stroma dependent maturing role as well. And some of that, there are some published work showing that macrophage is involved in that, uh, but I don't think people have actually studied into dendritic cells about, you know, but I think that's one of the aspects my lab is looking into now to see if in the dendritic cell material is also, for example, involved in antigen presentation or other pathway as well. Great and did question. you see DC activation in the Medherin um, inhibition models that you had? Uh, we didn't look specifically in DC cell. Uh, yeah, but we can easily look into that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jean, would you like to ask your question? Hey, Yibing, uh, good, good to see you virtually. Sorry, <laughs> can't see you in person. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll catch up tomorrow. I have a couple of questions. So, so does SMD1, independent of the interactions of MTDH, uh, uh, have uh, roles in 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 uh, as a as a cancer fitness gene and and other in other cancers as well or in other cell types? This is one question. And the other one is, what are other you know could there be other mRNA targets or RNA targets of SMD1 or MTDH and SMD1 together, um, um, uh, independent of the tap like, you know other than the tap targets, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's, it's a great question. So um, you know, a lot of the material functions seems to really depend on SMD1. You know, we have those mutants that lack SMD1 binding and then they lose a lot of activity. But on the flip side, as you ask, we, we don't know how much, we actually don't know much about what does SMD1 do. You know, is it doing more than MTDH or is it, you know, in other words, is it more important or perhaps too important for normal cell that is not a suitable target like bacteria or disrupting the interaction. So we are now in the process of making SMD1 conditional knockout mice. Oh, cool. Okay, it. great. And I think it also a lot of tool we're developing is also to try to address the question of 
do they bind to different cohort of RNA, you know, like RNA species? I think we, we, will, talk, we will talk about that more tomorrow about right. identifying the species of RNA they interact with. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, thank you. Great, great talk. Thank you. Next question is from Michael Karen. Would you like to unmute yourself? Uh, yeah. Okay. So, uh, very interesting results. Uh, you show that uh, the MTDH has a uh, SNED1 complex has effect on expression of uh, the you know the peptide the transporters uh, and loaders. Uh, but does the knockout have any effect on tumors grown in immunocompromised mice? Yeah, yeah. So, great question. So, um, bacteria in SND on complex have both a role in immune regulation, but also more intrinsic effect because a lot of study we did is actually using one is using xenograft model, and the second is also, you know, in mice tumor in a, in a deficient host, and it, it still have an effect. So, uh, even though probably less than you know immunocompetent model, especially in you know, the metastasis model, so part of that uh, effect is tumor intrinsic. Uh, so when you knock out methylene or you treat the treat the mice with the compound to block methylene, um, it will also cause the cell like more likely to apoptose under chemotherapy or, or just like proliferate less. So a lot of the the genes regulated by this complex is related to cell deaths or proliferation and those like regular, you know, growth pathways. And, you know, in paper, what we published, we also show that, you know, many of the genes related to oncogenic process like MYC is influenced by material SMD1 complex. So there's both a, a tumor intrinsic effect, but also a immune related effect. So which one is more important? Uh, relative importance, it, it's, it's hard to say because um, in, a, in an immunocompetent model, you are seeing a compound effect likely, right? Uh, both the tumor and three, the you know, immuno, but to, to tell rather the importance of each one, then you would need to maybe compare the therapeutic response in, um, in an immunocompetent model versus immunodeficient model, and then try to quantify how much of a difference we haven't really done that direct comparison. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you, yeah. Next is Aaron. Would you like to ask your question? Yes, I can. First of all, thank you very much for the great talk. I just couldn't really catch like how you found C26 as an inhibitor because um, did you screen like a huge library and why did you stick to those um, structure profiles? Yeah, uh, so how do you find C26? So initially what we did is using that split or superase assay, right? And then so we just screen a library. It's actually a relatively small library. It's about 50,000 compounds. So it's, it's not a, a huge library, but it, it, it's kind of maximized for diversity. It's, it's actually made by David Mac Macmillan when he moved to Princeton. He won a Nobel Prize last year. So, um, so we find the C26 compound and then from there, we then do some structure analysis. So we, we, we derive a few analogs that have similar structure and then test them one by one. And then, so we get a little bit optimized by you know, finding A6 analog is, is better. And, and then we use that to solve the crystal structure. Of it. And so the hope now is that now we know the structure of the compound binding group pocket, maybe we can design rationally additional compounds that perhaps form additional like hydro bonds to decrease the IC50. So now we can do rational design and like both your docking and all those like structure-based design, yeah. Okay, perfect, thank you. That was what I was missing, thank you. Yeah. Next is Lauren, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, sure. Hi, thanks, great talk. Um, I was just curious for the last thing that you presented, um, how you have sort of two groups of mice that, one that completely responds to the combination treatment and then one that sort of escapes treatment sort of at the tail end. And I was curious if you guys have looked into any genomic or transcriptomic differences between those two groups. Yeah, that's a good question. So I just want, of course I clarify that they all respond, but just to different degree, right? So some of them respond by like almost a remission, but some of them respond with, you know, delayed growth, but continuing progression. So 
we we have a look into that, but you raise an interesting question is why there's such a di different response? Because actually the cell that we inject is supposedly similar, similar tumor, uh, you know, and so uh, it, it could be maybe a stochastic, a little bit stochastic that somehow, you know, one maybe started uh, with a different, I don't know, immune population there or whatever. But I think we, it's worse expanding because it's a relatively small cohort, right? Only six mice, right? So, uh, you know, it will be necessary to expand it to maybe larger cohort, 20, 50, right? And see still whether there's still a diversity in response. And then, as you suggest, maybe, you know, pick in the tumor at the right time when we start to see the difference and then maybe profile one is there. So you can expression and second is maybe look, doing maybe a single cell only see, look at the population of cells in it to maybe understand better about why they respond differently in terms of maybe it's the tumor phenotype or, you know, for example, maybe they have a different relative expression or maturing level in vivo, or maybe they have a different starting point of the immune composition. I think it's, it's still useful to figure that out. Yeah. Jane, would you like to ask your question? Oh, hi. I thought Tran has a question before me, no? Oh, sure. Sorry. I can, Tran, yeah, I can ask wanna... if it's already on. Uh, hi, you've been really interesting about the interaction between Matt here and, and SND1. So I may have missed it. SND1 is a key component of the risk complex, right? So mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the targeted RMRA degradation you showed is the Matt here promote the, is the risk complex involved or you've just mm. the SMD1 is involved? Yeah. And does uh, Matherin like promote this function of the risk complex in general? This is more specific to SMD1. Yeah, yeah, that's a good, great question. We, we haven't looked into that much. Actually, we look into, initially the interest on the risk complex is on micro right? Because it's, it's yeah. in biogenesis. Yeah. But May, you know, we look into that many years ago. When we don't really have a, a lot of great genetic and pharmacological tool, and mm -hmm. we use the stable, like knockdown cell line. We didn't really see much microRNA difference, so we kind of like ignore that direction. But I think it's you raise a good point that maybe now is the time, right? Because now we have the right tool to maybe look at an acute situation, whether you know one is maybe somehow the risk complex is maybe involved in the stability control of the RNA, or maybe through mm -hmm. some kind of, I don't know, non-coding RNA guided mechanisms of uh, aggregation, mm -hmm. because micro RNA could reduce the stability of some of the RNA as well. So um, yeah, yeah we, we are looking into that now. Uh, we, you know, I think we are really looking to, one is to figure out the species of RNA being found and uh, you know, how, how they are bound by the complex and um, and then also, you know, how exactly the stability is con controlled by, by the complex. Yeah. yeah thank you. Uh, th great question. And Trent, did you want to go ahead and ask your question? Um, yeah. So, can you guys hear me? Cool. So, um, I had like a two part question. So, since meta hearing interferes with TAP12 and so interferes with MHC1 uh, expression on the cell surface. If you guys look to natural killer cell recruitment or if maybe natural killer cell recruitment is a positive prognostic marker. And then the second question was, since TAP1-2 interference is really common as a viral immune evasion mechanism, have you guys looked at repurposing mm -hmm. this inhibitor? Yeah, so great question. Uh, you know, the first question about NK cell, we we did look at we didn't look at the um, I think there's maybe one analysis we did look at the NK cell uh, I don't remember the detail of it um, I can I can look back and I, I think we we saw some difference but I don't remember you know, how big of a difference compared to the the T cell infiltration but yeah that's a definitely an interesting direction we should look into about NK cell recruitment. The second question about the viral immune evasion mechanism. Uh, yeah, that is, again, something we haven't looked into, but we should, because um, one question that always puzzles me is why 
we keep maturing our genome. You know, if it's it's not important for embryonic development, that, that why evolution is so highly conserved. So it, it must be doing something really important. And you know, maybe antiviral response is one of the you know mechanisms that could maturing could be involved. And so we we are thinking about maybe collaborating with virologists to look at how you know the status of maturing in influence either acute or chronic you know viral infections and then the immune response to those viral infections yeah great thank you yeah thank you great so that's it for the q a um again thank you so much for the presentation and look forward to discussing more later great thank you all right. Thank you, Yi Bing. Such a great talk. Thanks, Sarah, for being a great host. Thank you. Yeah, you know, there's a separate link for you to meet students. Yeah, I'll meet with yeah. the students. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Yeah, bye, everyone.